Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us on uh, Sunday morning here at ASCB. Uh, my name is Ross Whitaker. I'm a product manager for Thermo Fisher Scientific. I cover our genome engineering portfolio, which includes our uh, TAL and CRISPR products, our CRISPR libraries for screening, and our collection of pre-engineered and made-to-order uh, cell lines. So this morning, I'm going to take some time to talk about some of the protocols and some of the kit kits we've been developing to really speed the, the speed your genome editing products or projects and increase the efficiency of those projects. So um, briefly, what I'm going to do, a very quick introduction on genome editing. I think at this point, you know, this is such a hot topic. Everybody's very familiar there. And then I'm going to jump into our streamlined genome editing workflow, where we've taken the CRISPR editing workflow and we can go from design concept to having edited cells ready to pick clones in as little as four days. And then I'll touch on uh, a little, I'll spend some time on our collection of gene, gene art engineered cell models, which is the world's largest collection of pre-engineered CRISPR cell lines, and it's a rapid made-to-order service that you can take advantage of as well. So what is genome engineering? It sounds like a very complex thing, but really what we're trying to do is either add, replace, or remove DNA from target sequences. Okay? So there's a number of ways that we do this. Um, now everybody uses CRISPR, essentially. And what we're doing is taking advantage of the repair mechanisms in the cell, either non-homologous end joining or homology-directed repair, in order to either um, delete genes to recreate mutations that uh, are in diseases, or to dissect signaling pathways by eliminating gene functions or doing truncations so we don't target uh, gene products to this, the normal area. So, <clears throat> you know, this is really the new, new age of functional genomics uh, for understanding gene function, for recreating disease models, and uh, creating new transgenic animals. And this also has applications for um, crop engineering and things like that, but we're, really we're going to focus on mammalian cell culture engineering today. And of course I'm going to be talking about CRISPR-Cas9 throughout this presentation. Um, this is, you know, really the hottest topic in biology right now. It's really captured not only the research community, but also the, the uh, broader um, community as well has really recognized the power of this. And so you're seeing it not only in nature and science, but you're seeing it in mainstream magazines like Wired and in The Economist. And um, the top speakers like Jennifer Doudna, Emmanuel Charpentier, you see them giving TED Talks and things like that, right? So when we're designing a genome editing project, we can really break it down into three steps, right? So we first have to design our experiment. This includes designing our guide RNAs to target our uh, loci of interest, choosing which Cas9 formats we're going to use in order to accomplish that. Then we have to deliver them efficiently, de deliver those tools efficiently to the cells. And then finally, we need to be able to detect that one, we've made the edit we want, and we need to understand the efficiency with which we've made that edit. So as we go forward and try to isolate uh, clonal cell lines from those editing experiments, we know how many clones we need to pick in order to get what we need. So when we talk about the design element, there's really two things there. Like I said, you need to design your guide RNAs. And so we've de developed our CRISPR design tool online. It's part of the Thermo Fisher cloud. There's over 600,000 pre-designed guide RNAs in there for the human and mouse genome. So if you're looking to knock out a gene, um, those are some great, great resources for you to use there. And then we have multiple CRISPR-Cas9 formats, um, and really this gets down to, to being very application specific. Today what I'm going to focus on is our purified Cas9 protein and purified guide RNA kits, because really this is what we've found to be the highest efficiency and the most rapid process for creating uh, edits within cells. Then we have delivery of the tools. So once we build the tools, we need to get them into the cells efficiently. Um, today, uh, what I'm going to focus on, since we are talking about the protein, are two methods within the multiple methods that we can offer. That includes the lipofectamine CRISPR max, which has been formulated specifically for delivering purified Cas9 protein complex with guide RNAs, and our neon electroporation system, which has shown very, very high efficiency in some very challenging cells, including B cells and T cells. And then finally, uh, we need to be able to detect that the edit that we want is actually in the cells, and we need to know our efficiency. And so we have a range of tools for that. 
But as part of our four-day protocol, I'm really going to focus on our genomic cleavage detection kit, which gives you an idea of your editing efficiency. So as you move forward and you're selecting clones, you can make the calculations to understand how many clones I need to choose. So our process here for streamline, streamlining the workflow has really been to take a holistic view of the whole process, look for where the bottlenecks are, and then develop protocols and tools in order to alleviate those bottlenecks. So we started by saying, if we have the cell and we want to make an edit, what are we doing now? And, and this was, um, this was you know, last year when really everybody's using uh, plasmids and vectors in order to introduce these tools. So you, if, you, if you look at what has to happen in order for an edit to occur when you're using these tools, you can start seeing how you would lose efficiency and you, and you lose some of the speed. So first you have to clone your guide RNAs into the plasmids. So that's going to take you three, four days a week, maybe a little bit longer. Then when you deliver those plasmids to the cell, they have to get into the cell, then they have to get into the nucleus where they're translated, and we get the guide RNA and the Cas9 mRNA, which then has to be transported out of the cell. The Cas9 protein is transcribed, and then it has to couple with the guide RNA. Remember, the guide RNA is a single-stranded RNA, and it's floating around in the, uh, in the uh, cytoplasm. It's not going to be real stable. The half-life is only really a few hours. Once, it couple, once the uh, transcribed Cas9 protein binds to that guide RNA, then they have to be transported back into the nucleus. We have a nuclear localization signal in Cas9, which helps accomplish that, where it targets to its sequence of interest and introduces a double-stranded break. So that's a lot of steps that have to occur. So we took a look at, at streamlining that and just introducing the Cas9 mRNA and the guide. So the advantage here is, one, um, we don't have to clone at this point because we have a, a, a kit for purifying the guide RNA and we can produce the, the Cas9 mRNA in bulk. We, can, we deliver it into the cell. We have a lot more control over uh, how much Cas9 is expressed, and we have um, a lot more control over how long that Cas9 is expressed. When you have a plasmid vector, it goes into the cell, and it's going to be expressed for a week or more. And the edits happen very quickly, and now you have an activated nuclease circulating around the uh, genome looking for something to do, and this can contribute to off-target effects. So with the mRNA approach, we transfect in the mRNA, it's transcribed into Cas9 uh, protein, it couples to the guide, and it goes into the nucleus and it makes the edit. We said, what if we can streamline this even further, and we'll just purify the Cas9 guide RNA, and then we'll purify, or, sorry, we'll purify the Cas9 protein, we'll have a purified guide RNA, we'll couple those before we transfect them into the cell, and that way we create a stable ribonuclear complex, and the guide is now protected, so we don't have to worry about degradation of the single-stranded RNA when it's transfected into the cell. We can control the dosage, because we control how much protein we're putting in, how much guide we're putting in. And at the same time, the protein is turned over very quickly. So it goes in, it makes the edit, and the protein's turned over, and you don't have to worry about it hanging around looking for something else to do and potentially causing off-target edits. So this is how we work towards developing our four-day workflow for genome editing. And we're going to utilize our uh, precision guide RNA synthesis kit. So that eliminates all of the cloning steps. We're going to use our Cas9 protein because we've seen that that's one of the more efficient ways to deliver it. We have our transfection reagents to support that and then our genome cleavage detection kit. And so again, we can go from design concept to edit itself in less than four days. So in a single work week, you can be ready to start picking clones when you come into work the next week. So I want to walk through this on a day-by-day -day basis, really. So day one is the design day. We're, we're preparing for editing success. We have a couple of tasks that we need to do. We need to design the guide RNA. We need to order the oligos so that we can create the guide RNAs. And then we need to get our cells ready for our editing experiment. Okay. So the tool that we're really going to rely on for designing our guide RNA is our uh, CRISPR design tool, which again is on the Thermo Fisher Cloud. Um, but just quickly, as we talk about guide RNA design, so if we take a look at, at strep pyogenes, and everybody, uh, Cas9 from strep pyogenes, everybody's very familiar, but I just want to touch on a couple of key points when you're doing your guide design. 
there's two things that you really need in a, in, a, in a guide. You need a PAM sequence. You need to be able to identify a PAM sequence. That tells you where you're going to be able to make your edit. So in your target loci, the first step is to look for all the PAM sequences. Because your guide sequences are then going to be the 20 nucleotides that are 5 prime to that PAM sequence. Okay? So you can do this manually. A lot of people do. There's a lot of tools online to be able to do this. And you can identify all of the sequences um, that are available within the region that you want to target. But then you want to pick the best sequence. And really, when you want to pick the best sequence, you have to think about two things. What is the edit I'm trying to do? And I want to make sure I don't have any off-target edits. Edits, I want it to be specific, right? So there's some you know, design rules uh, out there. If you want to make a knockout, typically you're targeting the five prime exons of the coding region. The first couple of exons is proven to be probably one of the most effective ways to create knockouts. Okay? If you want to do a knock in and you're relying on homology directed repair and you're going to add in some donor DNA, you want that double stranded break to be pretty close to where you want to make your edit. So that's the region that you're going to target when you're creating your guides. Once you've determined where your target region is, you found the PAMs in the target region, now what you want to do is choose the most unique sequences. Because if your sequence matches somewhere else in the genome, especially if that other place in the genome has a PAM site, then you're going to get off-target cleavage. So this is where you've got to do a little bioinformatics, and this is what's built into our online tool. So really what you would like is a sequence that is completely novel and doesn't exist in the rest of the three billion bases in the genome. That's typically pretty hard to do. So you can look at the design rules and you say, okay, where do I need to make sure that I have my mismatches in order to have a unique sequence? And what's been shown is the seed region, which is the eight to 12 nucleotides that are directly five prime of the PAM, that's the most important set of uh, nucleotides that we need to make sure we have as many mismatches to other regions in the gene as possible in order to have a unique targeting sequence, okay? So when you use our uh, CRISPR design tool, we actually score the guide RNAs based on where the mismatches are to other regions in the nucleus and, um, and where the mismatches are within that 20 nucleotide um, guide sequence. And so the more mismatches you have in the seed region, the better guide it is, the higher score it is, and those will be the guides that we recommend. Okay? So if you go to the Thermo Fisher site and you get into our CRISPR design tool, there's actually a couple of ways you can use it. So I mentioned there's 600,000 pre-designed guides in there ready to go. They're mostly for knockouts. So if you have a gene you want to knock out, you can go into the CRISPR design tool. You can enter your gene of interest here. Uh, you can also choose which format we're going to use. So we've, we're talking about the uh, platinum Cas9, purified Cas9 protein. And this way it'll help you design the right oligos that you need in order to create your guides because it knows what system you're working in. You pick the species. We have both human and mouse designs on the uh, web tool. And then you basically walk through the process and you can order your oligos to take you to the next step. Now, if you want to do a de novo design because you're targeting a specific region and you want to do a knock-in, you can use this tool for that as well. So you can enter your target sequence. We'll find all the PAMs and score them for you so you know which are the best guides to pick. So once you've made your design and then you order your oligos, say that's Monday afternoon, you can, and really you just need uh, desalted oligos that can be delivered overnight, then they show up day two and it's time to make your guides. And you can do this before lunch. So uh, there's three steps basically with the uh, guide synthesis kit. You have to assemble the template, perform the IVT reaction, and then purify the guide RNAs. So let me walk you through this, this uh, process. Like I said, it's four hours. You can do this step before lunch. So in our gRNA synthesis kit, we have a master mix. And in that master mix, we have the, uh, an oligo which represents the 80 nucleotide static tracer sequence. And then we have a set of pri overlapping primers for, uh, on the 5 prime, which add the T7 promoter. And then we have an overlapping primer with the, um, or we overlap our oligo with the constant region here. 
And so the oligos that you're going to order are 34 nucleotide oligos, and this again will come from the uh, design tool online. And they represent your uh, target sequence here, and then they overlap with the primers. And what this allows us to do is to do a very simple uh, PCR assembly reaction. And this ends up being very clean. We don't have to do any purification here. But now you have the assembled template that we can run the IVT reaction off of. We run the IVT reaction. We take it through a cleanup step that's included. And now we have our purified guides that are ready to go into our experiment. And this is a very high yield process. We typically get greater than 10 micrograms of guide, and usually at a concentration of greater than 200 nanograms per microliter. Um, that's really on the low end, though, to be honest with you. Uh, we are taking this same process, and we're generating libraries of CRISPRs for screening. And typically what we're seeing is we're seeing um, guides beyond 20 micrograms, um, all the way up to more than 250 micrograms of guide. So it's a very, very efficient process for generating guide RNAs. And then when you go in and do your editing experiments, you know, we're really talking about using uh, maybe nan nanograms up to a microgram. So you have more than enough material comes out of this reaction. Very rapid process, and if you break it down at the end of the day, by the time you order the kit and your oligos, I think you're looking at less than $30 per guide. No cloning, the guides are ready to go in four hours. So then, that's the four hours before lunch, after lunch, on day two again, we can go ahead and now it's time to do our reaction. Okay, we seeded our cells on day one. They're ready to transfect. We created our guide. So what we're going to do is take our Cas9 protein. We're going to complex it with our guide RNA. We're going to decide how we need to deliver this to the cells. And we have two options. We can use lipid transfection or we can use electroporation. So it depends on your cell type. If you have a cell type that you're usually using lipofectamine or other lipid transfection reagents, then I'd stick with that, and we have protocols to support that. But if you have challenging cells, we can also take advantage of electroporation to get, that, to get the uh, tools in there. And then we go ahead and we incubate it for 48 hours, let the tools do their job editing the cell, and then we uh, will then see what we get at the end. So what this really comes down to on the delivery step is, is an optimization for the cell lines that you're using. And so we've gone through and we've tested um, about two dozen different cell lines here. And what we find is, you know, the cells that are very amenable to lipid transfection, um, we can use our, our CRISPR, lipofectamine CRISPR max reagent uh, to transfect these cells like we would with lipofectamine 3000 or RNA max or anything else in the lipofectamine portfolio. If you want to hear more about the CRISPR max, um, reagent, uh, Xavier, who is our director of R&D for transfection reagents, will be giving a talk on that at 1045 today. But what we also find, though, is there are plenty of cells, particularly B cells and T cells, which are fairly difficult to transfect with lipofectamine. And so what we're doing in this experiment here is we have a guide for the HPRT locus, and we're using that as our control. And we're transfecting in our, our Cas9 um, and our purified guide into these cell lines, and we're looking for not percent of transfection efficiency here, it's percent of indel formation. So this is looking for function at the end of the day. How many edits did we make, right? So again, if we look at some of the cells that we're all used to using, um, you know, two nine threes, we get nice 85% uh, indel formation, very, very high efficiency with this system. Um, it will, you know, HeLa cells are at 50%. Everything is very, very nice and high. But then we get down to these T cells and these B cells down here, and these are notoriously difficult to transfect. So that's where we can take advantage of being able to use this with the neon electroporator. And then we can go from maybe 19% in the T cells to more than 90% editing efficiency here. And with the B cells, we can't even transfect with the lipid reagents, but we're getting 30 to 50% uh, editing efficiency in these cells as well with the uh, electroporation. So it's really all about knowing, uh, understanding the cells that you're working with and optimizing the delivery for those cells. So one of the ways that we can do that is uh, on the neon electroporator, for instance, we have a, a, an optimized protocols. We have 24 protocols that you can test. You can identify which ones don't work. You can identify which ones do work. And so this was transfecting into IPSCs with the Cas9 protein and the guide RNA, again going after that HPRT locus to make an indel. So we find that uh, we can get 20 to 30 percent 
transfection efficiency with the DNA and the mRNA, but with the protein, uh, we get 60% of one microgram, and this is where the optimization comes in. We can start adding protein to it, so 62%, 80%, 89% transfection efficiency. So you can really just step it up where you need it to be. And at the end of the day, um, the cells still maintain their um, stemness. So we're not killing them, we're not turning them into other cells. Now we have edited iPSC cells that we can take forward into our experiments. And the same thing's true for, for other iPSCs. So those were with the Gibco iPSCs. And here's another example, another experiment here where we're up to 80%. We also do this in, in H9s as well. So these are some notoriously difficult cells to work with. So once we've done our design and we've created our guide RNAs, we've optimized our delivery system and we've put the tools in, then we need to make sure we got the edit we want in the cells and we need to understand the efficiency with which we got that edit in there so we can go forward, select the right number of clones and isolate a cell line that we can use in our research. Because ultimately that's the goal, right? Is to get a cell line that we can take forward in our research. So this is where our GCD kit comes in. This is again is another, it's another very uh, rapid method. So this utilizes uh, T7 endonuclease. So we go in and we make our edit. We then take a subsample of those cells and um, we PCR up our target region. So in some of those cells, we will have uh, indels formed if we're looking at um, making knockouts, of course. So what we do is we denature and we re-anneal, and when we re-anneal those indels where we've added or deleted DNA are not gonna match perfectly to the unedited. So we end up with a bubble. So then we can bring in the T7 endonuclease. It identifies these mismatches. We can run it on a gel. And we can see here's the control uncut, and here's the cut DNA, and then we can do an analysis of what our editing efficiency is. And then we know if we've got 10% editing because we're looking at a difficult cell line and a difficult locus, that we're gonna have to pick quite a few clones. But if we've got 90%, then we know we don't have to pick as many clones in order to isolate a cell line moving forward. So it's a nice, quick way to make sure, one, I got an edit in there, two, what do I need to do moving forward to isolate a cell line from this? So that's the, the quick overview of this, this four-day editing protocol. A um, number of online tools to help you, a number of protocols to help you achieve this, and a number of, of really simple, easy-to-use kits. But what if we could streamline the workflow even more beyond four days? What if we didn't have to do any editing at all, we just had access to the edited cells we need? And so this is the idea behind the GeneArt Engineered Cell Models Collection. And so we partnered with Horizon Discovery here in order to um, offer the largest collection of CRISPR engineered cell lines and a really rapid made to order system where instead of doing the edit yourself, we can do it for you and deliver the cells to you. If we've got the cells on our shelf, we've already created them, you can have them in seven days. Isolated clonal cell lines. If, you, if it's not ourself, uh, on our shelf, it's a rapid made to order system, we can turn them around in less than 10 weeks. And so at the end of the day, we're not really all that interested in just becoming experts in genome engineering. What we want to do is create cell models that can drive our research programs, right? And it doesn't matter if you're doing functional genomics, you're studying signaling pathways, metabolism, cancer research, everybody's looking for a better model to drive their research forward. And that's why we're all very excited about CRISPR-Cas9 and the ability to perform these genome editing experiments. So just to give you an idea, I mean, one of, the, one of the main advantages with genome editing is at the end of the day, what you end up with is a matched isogenic pair that you can carry forward in your experiments. So right now, if you go to ATCC or you go to any other cell collection and you want to get a quote unquote normal cell and you want to get a disease cell from a patient, those are coming from two different patients. They have variable genetic backgrounds and so you might have all this noise in the background on top of the mutation that you're interested in studying. But when we're creating cells with gene editing, we can have a matched genetic background because we start with our isolated clone from our parental line. We can expand that into two populations. We then bring in our editing tools and we edit one of those populations. We can isolate clones and then we expand and sequence verify those edited clones and now we have this perfect match pair. 
And essentially the only difference between the two is the edit that we introduce. And so now we can have confidence in uh, the uh, results that come out of the follow-on work that any phenotypic changes we're seeing are due to that edit and not due to the fact that I'm looking at cells from two different patients. So this is one of the real powers of genome editing, and we've made sure we include this in our gene art uh, cell models. So every cell model ships with the matched parental cell line. You have an isogenic pair that you can carry forward, and you can be confident in the results that you see. So what's in this collection? We have both knockouts and knock-ins available. Right, so there's over, this is an older slide, I should have updated, but I think there's over 2,000 knockout cell lines that we can ship to you in seven days. And then there's a probably three or 400 ready to go knock-in cell lines. And then we have a rapid made-to-order service as well. And so with our rapid made-to-order service, um, that expends the possibilities to become limitless. So we have a lot of data on what genes are essential, what, we, what genes we can knock out and still maintain a cell line. So there's over 14,000 knockouts that we can offer. And there's really an unlimited number of um, knock-ins that we can recreate here. And so what does this do for us if we think about how we compare cell models that we can create now with Cas9 and genome editing versus how we used to do experiments, right? So before, as I mentioned, if you wanted to study a disease model, you'd go find a patient and try to isolate a cell line from them, and then you'd have a normal cell line for comparison. So that would introduce all kinds of genetic diversity. You didn't really have a matched wild type control. And then one of the other real problems that you run into, especially when you're trying to create mutations to dissect a signaling pathway, so you want to knock out a phosphorylation site or make a kinase dead mutant, those mutations aren't always available for you to study in a patient population. So now we can create those. So it opens up the number of experiments that we can do. When we start thinking about how we did functional genomics and, and we create knockouts, we would do this with RNAi, siRNA, shRNA. But I think we're all familiar with some of the problems that you run into there. You get incomplete knockdowns, so you may not see strong phenotypes. There's a lack of reproducibility because of some of the off-target effects that you see and just day-to-day -day variation in the percentage knockdown you get. If I have 40% knockdown today and 70% knockdown tomorrow, am I seeing the same phenotype in every experiment that I'm doing? When you create a knockout cell line with genome editing, it's a knockout today, it's a knockout tomorrow, it's a knockout next week. And then finally, when we look at gain of function analysis, traditionally this has been done with plasmids where we overexpress a mutant form of a gene. But we're overexpressing it on top of the wild type and so that introduces you know, all kinds of artifacts into our studies. It's difficult to achieve stable models like that sometimes because you are driving such high expression. Um, a lot of times people are doing this with promoters like CMV that are just producing tons and tons of this, this mutant protein. And again, you get off-target effects because now you have all kinds of proteins. Say you're studying a kinase, you have this active kinase floating around looking for something to do. It's going to find something to do. So when we do genome editing, everything is in context of the endogenous gene. So we can create a mutation that's under control of the, of the endogenous promoter. Um, so we don't have to worry about it being overly expressed. We don't have to worry about it being expressed on top of the wild type gene. So there's many, many advantages here that we can carry forward into our research. So again, I think I've covered this, our gene art engineered cell models collection. So if we're talking about being able to offer 14,000 knockouts and unlimited number of knock-ins and we can turn things around in 10 weeks, what's being done here so we can really speed the production of engineered cells in order to get these in your hands, right? And what we're taking a look at here is really one of the main challenges when you're doing genome editing is the diploid nature of mammalian cells. So everybody has two copies of each chromosome. One comes from mom and one comes from dad. So if you want to create a knockout, you got to knock out both alleles. If you want to create a, a homozygous mutation, you need to insert that knock-in in both alleles. So what if there was a way that we could not deal with the diploid nature and have to worry about our mutations being masked by the second wild type copy? And so what we're doing here for a lot of our cell models is we're engineering them in HAP1. So HAP1 is a human cell model that can exist in a haploid state. So it has one copy of each chromosome. It gets rid of this uh, diploid editing problem, increases your efficiency dramatically. So this is a new workhorse cell line. It was isolated from, uh, it's an adherent 
uh, cell line that was isolated from a leukemia patient. So it's got a history not unlike that of HeLa. It doesn't, it actually, in fact, has a fibroblast-like morphology and looks very similar to HeLa. It's a workhorse cell line that we can use in the same way that we use HeLa or HEK. So what are the advantages here? Well, we have a defined copy number to start with. Uh, when you go and uh, do your sequencing, it's unambiguous with these cell lines because there's only one copy of the chromosome you're worrying about. It's highly efficient now because we only have to make an edit in one chromosome. So when we look at knockouts, we get a two-fold two greater efficiency with the HAP1s. When we're looking at defined uh, mutations, it's actually tenfold more efficient. So there's a lot that can be gained by taking advantage of the haploid nature of these cells. And then these have been really well characterized. So they've been sequenced. We have RNA expression data. So if you want to know, um, if you want to know if this is a suitable model, we can look and see what's the expression of your gene, what's the expression of that pathway, and let you know, hey, you know, sometimes this isn't the best model. And we'll, we can let you know ahead of time. And then this, uh, it actually was just published in, in Science last week, um, using this cell line, we actually have fantastic data on essentiality. So when, you, when we look to create knockouts, we're not going to struggle trying to create knockouts for essential genes where we're not going to be able to isolate a clone because we know ahead of time, you know, this isn't a, a gene target we should be going after with this. And you can go after it with uh, maybe RNAi or something else where you get an incomplete knockdown and to study what the role of that gene is because with a complete knockout, you're going to kill the cell. So again, this is a new workhorse cell line and it's a rich resource for rapid hypothesis testing. I'm not saying you know, this is going to replace your cell model of choice, but I think everybody's used HeLa or HEK U2OS in their research at some point to test an idea and then move it into their model system of choice. And this is another resource to allow you to do that. So one thing I always hear is, um, well, it's HAP1, it's, it's only got half the number of chromosomes. That, I'm worried about that, that seems kind of weird. You know, I'm used to using normal cells. And I ask, okay, what cells are you using? Well, I use HEKs. Okay, I wouldn't call HEKs normal. But we know that they're useful. We know these workhorse cell lines are useful. We use them all the time. We use them for our research, we use them for bioproduction, we use them. They all display chromosomal aberrations. So HeLa cells are at some positions monoploid, at some positions diploid, at some positions they have triploidy, tetraploidy. Same for U2OS, same for HEKs, they're mostly uh, display t triploidy and tetraploidy and most of the chromosomes. So in fact, it's almost as if the HAP1s are more normal, more close to a normal human karyotype. But really it comes down to the application data. What can we do with these new, with these models? And for a workhorse cell line like HeLa or HEK, one of the reasons that they've been used for so long is because really they're applicable to a lot of different questions. And so in order to make sure HAP1 is applicable to a lot of dif different questions, we need, to, we need to do some of these studies. And these are starting to come out, and I'll share some of that data with you now. But what we're able to do, since we can engineer these so rapidly, we can take on entire pathways. We can take on entire gene families. So we can offer, you know, instead of buying a kinase knockout library, we can uh, provide a library of knockout cell lines that have been validated that you can move forward in your research in your screens. Um, you can set, pick a set. So this would be a set that might be interesting for studying inflammation because you have knockouts in the pathways of NF-kappa B and, and GSK3 beta, right? So, but are people using these and using them successfully? That's the big question that everybody, is, but everybody wants to know. And the, and the question is yes. And so I'll show you a diverse uh, some diverse applications with this as I close out my, my talk here today. And, you know, this was a, a paper that came out in neurology uh, earlier this year, and they're looking at uh, alpha dystrophin. So alpha dystrophin is involved in uh, muscle and CNS development. Uh, the DAG1 gene, um, it produces uh, dystrophin, uh, the dystrophin peptide, which is cleaved into both alpha dystrophin and beta dystrophin. So in this uh, in this study, they were looking at uh, some mutations that they identified in uh, a child that had uh, developmental problems due to uh, a dystrophinopathy. And they were able to go into the HAP1 cells, they created a DAG knockout, 
And then they were able to go back in and do rescue experiments and overexpress the um, mutated forms, uh, the, 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 mut the mutations that they found in this patient. And so they took the HAP1 cells and they created the DAG knockout. And what we're looking at here, this IIH6, is an antibody that recognizes alpha dystrophin. So in the wild type cells, alpha dystrophin is expressed. So this is expressed in most cells. It's, it's involved in cell adhesion as one of its main, main uh, functions. In the uh, HAP1 knockout, we don't see any expression. And we can come back in and rescue it with wild type DAG. But then when we introduced these mutations that they found in this child, they found that even though they had uh, the full length DAG protein there, the alpha dystrophin wasn't being processed correctly and it wasn't being sent to the membrane. So this is what was the, you know, demonstrated the underlying cause of the disease in this child. While off of the same protein, we weren't seeing any problems with beta dystrophin. Uh, and this is coming off the same peptide. So I know this is something specific with the processing of this peptide uh, because of the mutations at these positions. This was a similar study, um, also looking at a dystronopathy, but looking at the role of sialic acid and sialation of, uh, of uh, mannose on the alpha dystroglycan. Uh, so uh, they were able to go in and knock out uh, SLC35A1. Uh, you can create this knockout very quickly. Uh, this study here was using the same HAP1 cells. They just happened to use towels to make the knockout. But again, it's another broad ranging application. You can take the HAP1 cells and you can use them to look at bacterial vir virulence. So we we're looking at um, Clostridium difficile here, and it has a toxin that's hypervirulent in some of its strains. And what they did was they used the HAP1 cells to identify which, what's the target of the toxin in these cells. And it turns out it's this lipolysis stimulated lipoprotein receptor is attacked by this toxin. This is what leads to cell death. So uh, when they knock it out in the cell, then when they put the, clostrid the uh, clostridium toxin, the cells are, um, the cells survive in the knockout. And then if they come on and add back the uh, LSR receptor, then they become sensitive to CDT again. So this is another, again, broad application for a workhorse cell line. Uh, and then this is looking at autophagy in these cell lines as well. So uh, this is looking at interferon gamma response and, and toxoplasma as part of an autonomous uh, immunity system. And again, so when you starve cells, you'll see autophagy as they recycle the organelles. So we go from the non-starved state in the wild type into this uh, starved state and we're staining for LC3 and we see the puncta forming for the autophagosomes. And then when we start looking at this, uh, these ATG mutants, we start realizing we have a defect in autophagy here when we have toxoplasma uh, infection. And so this was a, another study in the Journal of Immunology that came out last year. So one, so a wide, wide number of applications for the HAP1. I also want to point out in the collection we have some very specific uh, cancer mutations as well. These are not all in HAP1. Some of these are in different backgrounds of uh, cells that we use all the time, HCT116s, MCF7s. Um, and so there's some, some great applications here, again, where you can take these isogenic models and you can have confidence in the results coming out of them. So this is one looking at um, BRCA2 sensitization to PARP inhibitors. And so when you do a gemtocytobine, which is part of a standard chemotherapy, you know, they're just as sensitive as the regular cells here, as, as the cells that are not missing BRCA2. But when we come back in with Olaparib, which is the specific PARP inhibitor, now we're able to identify a chemotherapeutic agent that has a specific effect on the cells with the mutation. Okay. And we've got a number of different BRCA mutations. We've got a number of different mutations in different oncology genes. I just want to highlight it as a separate resource within the, the larger collection. So again, we have uh, able to offer more than 14,000 knockouts, a nearly unlimited number of knock-ins. We can do the editing for you, do it quickly, turn it around, get the cell lines in your hands. They're an ideal model to study the functional impact of mutations on a number of different pathways. Again, 
It's a workhorse cell line. Use it to test your hypotheses rapidly, identify what you want to move forward with, and then build it in your models that you're using every day in your lab. So in conclusion, um, what I've highlighted today, we have a, a, a four-day gene editing process. Helps you go from design concept all the way to edit itself very quickly. So we can design tool, we can design CRISPR guide RNAs that are um, efficient and have limited off-target effects using our CRISPR tools online. We have a kit to rapidly synthesize your guide RNAs. Takes less than four hours. There's no cloning involved. Just need a pair of oligos. Um, there's multiple Cas9 formats available. We've really highlighted what you can do with the purified protein today, but it comes down to optimizing for your system. That's how you're gonna get the most efficient results. So anything that you can transfect really well with lipid-based transfection, we're gonna recommend that you stick with that when, when you move to the Cas9 protein. Any of those really difficult cells, we can get it in there with electroporation and get very high efficiency. And then finally, we have our uh, GeneArt Engineered Cell Models as a resource for you to pull from to accelerate your research. And I just want, also want to highlight that we have um, a number of really dedicated scientists that are building these tools every day, and they also are part of our custom services lab. So if you need help building any of these tools or building specific tools or building specific cell models, that's something that we can help you do. And we're looking to support the research community from end to end. So whether you're doing it yourself with our CRISPR and CRISPR Cas9 tools, whether you're using our engineered cell models to really accelerate your research by getting clonal cell lines in your hand in as little as a week, or you're using uh, our custom services to get the perfect model, you know, any mutation in your system, um, we're here to support you. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time this morning, and uh, I'll take any questions.